Hi, welcome back to Biochemistry Laboratory Techniques. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about affinity chromatography. And we're not going to go into the details on exactly how it works, but we're going to talk about um, ultimately how you, once you have a chromatogram generated, how you interpret the chromatogram. And that's what this is up here. This thing right here is called a chromatogram. Okay, and ultimately what the chromatogram can help, uh, help you just kind of see is ultimately from the column the order in which certain things elute from the column. Okay, before we go into too much detail on that, I will say this, this is uh, part of a two-part video. In the uh, next video, we're, we're going to show, I'm going to show you how to ultimately generate something like this from data. Okay, it's actually not too terribly difficult. It requires a Microsoft Excel or a... Um, a, another uh, kind of program like that, but we'll show you how to do that. So what is basically affinity chromatography? Affinity chromatography is based on the principle that certain proteins usually um, have different affinities or bioaffinities for biomolecules. Okay, so for example, if you have an enzyme, we'll get, just give you an example, you have an enzyme such as hexokinase, may not have gotten to that yet, that's an enzyme in glycolysis, um, hexokinase has an affinity for the molecule ATP. Lots of other proteins do, but um, hexokinase in particular will bind ATP. It's one of the substrates of its reaction. So if you wanted to, um, to have a column that bound hexokinase, then you should theoretically have something attached to the column that resembles ATP. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, if, you're do, if, you're trying, if you're doing affinity chromatography on lactate dehydrogenase, another enzyme, its substrate is NAD, um, a coenzyme. So if you wanted to bind NAD into a column through chromatography, you may wish to have an analog of NAD to, what, to which it can stick onto. Okay? So the basis of affinity is that um, it's usually something that a protein likes often a substrate or a coenzyme, and you want something in the walls of the column that resembles that molecule so that, in theory, the protein that you want will stick onto it, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So a very abstract example over here is, let's suppose this molecule right here, it's like a pink circle with a little bar sticking off, right? And let's say this thing right here is the normal substrate or coenzyme of some enzyme. This blue thing is the enzyme. I tried to indicate an active site on it. And you can kind of see how the active site kind of fits around uh, this substrate, right? And this is the normal substrate. Now suppose you wanted to do affinity chromatography on this enzyme, right? Well, then in theory, you'd want something like this. Notice this looks like the normal substrate, but I actually tried to indicate that this thing sticking off looked a little bit different than it did over here. So it resembles it. It's not exactly it, and so what we call that is an analog. This is what's called an analog, okay, of the original substrate. And if it's similar enough, then this enzyme, or if it's another kind of protein, whatever, it will bind onto this molecule. It won't catalyze a reaction necessarily, it won't, I mean it's not the actual substrate, but it will at least stick onto it, okay? The other basis of affinity chromatography is if this thing is not the substrate of an enzyme, then that enzyme won't have any incentive to stick on it, and it'll just fall through the column, basically, okay? But any protein that would normally bind this molecule may stick onto this, okay? So, in other words, if you think about the column, you think about what should happen. If you have a bunch of, if you have some proteins that like this molecule, they should stick onto it in the column, right? They should stick onto it. And you wouldn't expect them to elute very easily from the column. But if you, and then you have other proteins that don't like this molecule, it's not their substrate, and they just kind of fall through the column. You would expect those proteins to elute first. And then, any protein that likes this molecule and sticks onto it in the column, you might expect to elute last. And that's actually what we, that's exactly what we observe, okay? Let's look at a, a specific example, not just an abstract picture, but it's a specific example of how um, affinity chromatography works at a molecular level. All right, so this over here, this is actually um, the column of one of the affinity columns you can set up. Um, notice that this nitrogen has some carboxyl sticking off. They have a negative charge. And then there's a nickel 
um, cation right here, nickel in the two plus oxidation state. Notice these negative charges can interact and bind the nickel because they're opposite in charge. And then here's a protein maybe that's of interest. And a lot of times what you can do is you can stick, um, you can modify a protein to where it possesses a histidine tag. And it usually has six histidines, although it only indicated two for simplicity. And histidines, our group, has a nitrogen right here that can actually, um, through electrostatic interactions, also bind onto the nickel from the other side. So it's sort of one of these things where you have this protein and these histidines. The protein is attached to the nickel, which is attached to the carboxyls, which is attached to the column. So, you know, by transference, the protein is now stuck on the column through this, um, this blend of interactions right here. The protein's stuck on there. If the protein doesn't have this tag on it, then it doesn't stick to the nickel and it should just come through, all right? So this protein right here, whatever it is, you should expect to probably elute last. And if it doesn't have this or nothing that even closely resembles it, it should probably elute first. By the way, this kind of um, chromatography, this is called nickel affinity. Just some side piece of information. All right, so let's go up to the chromatogram, all right? So the chromatogram basically is a plot um, usually of absorbance. There are other ways you can measure um, if a protein is, um, measure proteins that come out in solution from the, chrom from the chromatography column. It's just that absorbance is one of the most common ways to do it, so we're gonna stick with absorbance. Here on the x-axis, we have the fraction number. Now, your professor will probably go into more detail on what the fraction number is, but suffice it to say, when the protein solutions elute from the column, you basically catch them in kind of a test tube kind of thing. You catch them in, in, in different fractions. So for instance, this first fraction, this is fraction number one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth, and each of these fractions you measure the absorbance of. So for instance, fraction one had an absorbance of about 1.3, um, fractions two through six were, a, in, in this case it's greater than four. Um, if you look at this is eight, nine, fraction nine was about 3.6, and so forth. So you just measure the um, absorbance of each fraction, okay? And that's all you're doing. And in total, this particular experiment, they collected 26 fractions, okay? So it can be a pretty long process to do this, okay? But the question is, what is each big peak on the curve? What does it represent? Well, if we, if we keep in mind the principle that thing, if we have a column that has, um, if, if we're dealing with an enzyme that we want, and we have an analog of its substrate on the walls of the column, then it should stick on the column and it should elute last. So generally things on the right side, where the um, you know, if we, if we consider it going this way, which it always does, things on the right side, that's stuff that has high affinity. And that's usually what we want. What we want is ordinarily always on the right side. Things that have no affinity, or we could say low affinity, these things are on the left side. And so as we go from left to right, it tends, the tendency is, for, is there, for there to be higher and higher affinity, all right? So whenever you do an affinity chromatogram, and you can Google pictures of this and you'll see the same thing, you generally have this region up here on the left side that is um, very broad and it has a lot of absorbance, okay? What is that? This is what we call the non-binding region. This is the non-binding region. You'll notice that it's kind of ironic, apparently, that all the absorbances of two through six are four. They're actually not. In reality, the absorbances are probably really, really high. It probably goes off of the screen quite a bit. The reason that it indicates four is because, in this case, the spectrophotometer that was used had a maximum absorbance of four. But the reason that the absorbance is so high here is that the percentage of proteins that have a high affinity over here on the right side is very, 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 very low. The percentage of proteins that have little or no affinity are exceptionally high. In fact, the ratio might be, if you just, if you, this, if this was one of your first purification steps, you might have a ratio of like 98% over here and 2% over on the right side. So you have a ton of proteins that are non-binding, so that's why the absorbance is crazy. It could be even as much as 20 in reality, but it's just that the instrument can't read that high. So these proteins don't bind to the column, 
for example, if it was this enzyme over here, they're not binding to this you know, analog, so they just come through. And so they're not binding, so they elute first. So I would say basically anything in this region over here, this is the non-binding region, okay? Non-binding, so they come through first. And there's a lot of them that do that, okay? Now, you know, I made it seem maybe like the protein either has really high affinity or no affinity. Well, there are certain cases where some proteins can have an intermediate affinity. All right, they have an intermediate affinity, okay? So they still stick on, but nowhere, nowhere, as, nowhere near as close as this protein right here, okay? They don't stick on that tightly, but they do stick on there. And so when you run it through the column, they'll stick a little bit, but they'll stick enough to where they don't come out in this non-binding region. So what you have to do is apply a wash, and you do it with a wash buffer generally. So what the wash buffer does is anything that has moderate or intermediate affinity for the column, it washes all that stuff out. But the wash buffer is not strong enough to elute the protein of interest. This guy in here really sticks on the analog. So you apply the wash buffer on this and you're never going to elute this protein because the wash buffer is, is it, it sort of is like an elution buffer, but it's not very strong, okay? It's not strong enough to elute the protein of interest. Um, it's just, it's kind of a weak one, but it's enough to elute all this stuff. So basically this stuff right here, that stuff, this stuff right there, these are um, ultimately not of interest. These are not of interest. These are proteins that may have had some affinity for the column, but they're really not what we want, okay? They're not this protein, which it happens to be this one. This is the one we want right here. That's the one we want. Um, they, they don't bind as strong as this. They don't bind as strong as this protein. So the wash buffer is weak, but it's strong enough to knock these out of the column, okay? And in the wash buffer region, which is um, ultimately where this shaded in blue is, you can have different strengths of wash buffer, but the key is that they're nowhere near as strong as the elution buffer, okay? So you use the wash buffer, you get rid of this stuff. So this is, um, this is not the protein we want. Okay, this is not the protein we want. And so once we wash all of that stuff out, we're ready to elute. So we're pretty confident that most of the stuff has left, and now all we're left with is the protein of interest, which in this case is this guy right here. Now, this enzyme binds very tightly to the analog on the wall of the column. So we need something relatively strong to knock it out, and that's why we use an elution buffer. Now, the elution buffer is typically buffered with the same buffering species as the wash buffer because you don't, generally when you're doing an experiment like this, you don't change the buffer. That's not good for the system. You keep the buffer the same, but generally what the elution buffer has is it has sodium chloride or some other salt. You may have heard of a technique called salting out, okay? What salting out does is salt has charge. When you put this in water, this becomes sodium cation and chloride anion, okay, because they're soluble. So when you stick this in water, it does two things. Number one, it drastically, because it's usually pretty highly concentrated, drastically increases the ionic strength of the solution running through the column. So because you're adding all these ions, the ionic strength goes way up. But what that does is these ions actually compete with this protein right here. They compete and they actually break the interaction between the protein active site and the analog. The way to think about it is to look at this nickel affinity right here. So you say this nickel right here is positively charged, so it likes negative charges. Well, if, you, if your salt that you were salting out with in the elution buffer was sodium chloride, then you say, well, maybe the chlorides, they're negatively charged, maybe they would like to stick on the nickel, right? they would like to stick on the nickel. So now there's less positive charge to interact with the imidazole nitrogens of the histidine of the protein of interest, but there's also sodium ions. So maybe the sodium um, may be interested in these nitrogens. The sodium likes to interact with these and so forth. And ultimately, because now the sodium and the chloride ions are competing um, with the nickel and the imidazole nitrogens of the histidine, the protein now just falls off. 
okay? And it's all due to competition with the stationary phase, okay, which is this thing right here on the column, okay? The chlorides stick on the nickel, and now the, the protein can't stick on the nickel because the chlorides bind stronger. And this technique is called salting out. And you don't have to have a situation like this. This is just for nickel affinity, um, chromatography, which is affinity, okay? But in general, for every, any time you use affinity chromatography, salting out is what you use as the final step in the elution buffer, okay? And because it's buffered and you have this um, sodium chloride for salting out, it's considered the strongest of all the um, washes slash elutions that you do. And it's enough to cause the protein of interest to elute, okay? Um, and so the protein of interest is all, oops, is all of this in here generally. Okay, and so if you were trying to purify the protein, what you're going to want to do is look at these fractions. And I would probably venture to say on this one, the most prominent fractions would be 21, 22, and 23. Those are probably the most. I would take those fractions and I would just collect them and discard everything else. Okay, now I would have to be sure that the protein of interest was in here, right? And the way I could do that is I could test it somehow. Okay, maybe the protein that I'm interested in has some other property, a very unique or distinct property that I could measure. If it does, I can just measure that and test to see whether that protein is in these three fractions. If it is, then I'm going to collect these three, combine them, or pool them, and everything else is just garbage. Get rid of it. These are non-binding proteins. That's not your interest. You just discard those. These in the middle of the wash, those are also not your interest. Get rid of those and only keep the protein that you want. Okay. And the whole point of affinity chromatography is you use the specificity of your protein of interest, make a stationary phase in your chromatography column that resembles the thing that this protein likes, as in its substrate or something like that. It sticks on there and then everything else goes through to some extent because they don't like this analog. They don't like this. They don't like this guy, right? But this guy, this protein, does like this analog, okay, and he's happy to. So they stick on there, and then once you think you've eluted everything else, then you apply the elution buffer and get your protein of interest and pool those fractions, okay? And that's the basis of affinity chromatography. So generally when you're doing affinity chromatography, what you're doing is you're purifying usually a protein or, or enzyme. Okay, you're, you're purifying it. And this is actually, after this, we do after these chromatography discussions, this is going to lead us into doing what is called a purification table. Okay, and we're going to do that in some of the next videos. Okay, that's a really important thing for quantifying how pure your protein is. So we're going to do that in the next video, and um, make sure to join us. Like this video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications, and thank you for watching.